anyway, we can go ahead and get uh, get started if you want. Put it like this here. Sometimes it's maybe good to not get as many cases, just to kind of drive dive deeper into the cases that you've you got. All righty, I'll be describing this one this morning. Um, so we have, you know, either an excisional or a punch biopsy on a, a acral surface. Um, that we have a kind of um, nodular piece on the side, and then this acral surface on the on the left. So you think this is more of the pathology, or you think it's kind of more over here? I think it's the one on the right. Yeah, and you know, sometimes when you look at these biopsy techniques, it kind of gives you a little bit of a clue as to what the clinician may have been doing. You know, they may have said, they may have thought this thing was like a cyst or something. So they said, well, let's just kind of do maybe an enucleation of it. And they took out some skin and they got in there and said, wow, this thing isn't really coming out like a cyst. And they went in and kind of shelled out as much as they could. So it's kind of like a, like you said, sort of closer to an excisional biopsy. It's not really a on block excision, like a melanoma or something like that. But you can kind of imagine if you're in the clinic and you think somebody's got a cyst somewhere on their volar skin, how you're going to take that biopsy. Mm -hmm. This is volar skin. So it didn't come out very easily. That's why it kind of looks ugly. Yes. <laughs> the pathology over here, you're right. So what is the, um, what do you think, inflammatory or neoplastic or maybe kind of a combination of those or what's your thought process here i'm feeling that this is a more neoplastic process um okay, good. uh looking at the uh, like benign versus um malignant i was leaning more benign good and uh i know you know the reason why but maybe you can articulate that to some of your colleagues in the room there mm -hmm. um so it seems very well circumscribed um and there's not a lot of mitotic figures yeah, it's it's relatively small. I mean, you can get obviously benign lesions to be big too. You can get lipomas that are the size of softballs or even bigger, uh, but they're still benign. Um, but it seems to be relatively small. It's very well circumscribed. It seems like it kind of did sort of shell out. I mean, they they had a little trouble getting it out, but it, it's you know fairly well contained here. So those are all things that are that favor benign. And then you you can look at cytologic features as you go down to higher magnification. And yeah, you notice that these cells really weren't strikingly atypical and uh, weren't any real mitotic figures. So good. Did you think this was more of an epithelial or a non-epithelial lesion? Um, I was favoring a non-epithelial um, lesion. Um, these cells looked mostly fibrohistiocytic. Okay, so so uh, given that we have a little bit longer time to discuss cases this morning, um, you said fibrohistiocytic, but what when you're trying to compare, say, an epithelial cell mm -hmm. to a non-epithelial cell, mm -hmm. what do what are some of the features of epithelial cells generally versus non-epithelial cells when you're looking at them? at higher magnification, like here, for example. You can say these look like fibroblasts and histiocytes, but if you're talking to a first-year medical student, they say, well, what, what's a fibroblast or histiocyte look like? Yeah, so I, they don't understand that. I agree with you, yes. but they don't understand what that means. So so what's, so if you're going to just tell someone at a lower level, this is an epithelial cell because, and this is a non-epithelial cell because, what are some of the criteria or the features that you really use to distinguish those? Um, great question. I feel like I even, <laughs> you know, ask myself this all the time. Um, I, for the fibrohistiocytic cells, I was thinking because the nuclei are kind of elongated, um, there's not like this like uh, cytoplasm, like really well-defined around them. And that's kind of like less epithelial. Well, <laughs> Basically, if you think about an epithelial cell, the purpose of an epithelium um, is either is to form some kind of a barrier. You know, so for example, like our stratified squamous epithelium in our skin, uh, basically is our barrier between our internal part of our body and the outside world. And so, the cells generally tend to be like little bricks 
and they tend to be very closely adherent to one another. So the desmosomes mm -hmm. are kind of like the mortar and the cells themselves are kind of like little, either they're flat cells that gradually like the, you know, cells in the, uh, in the cornified layer become flattened and they form keratin, they form your outer stratum corneum. But if you look at the basal cell layer, they're kind of cuboidal, square shaped, mm -hmm. and they're really closely ad adherent to one another. And so they tend to look, Kind of have that morphology if you will and if you think about like epithelial cells say of of like a duct somewhere so if you think about those cells even even cells like line say the duct of say your uh in, in a liver you know for example those cells are little small cuboidal cells also and they're kind of closely so that you think about an epithelium is basically it's almost like a raincoat if you will it's just trying to form a barrier between one sort of uh, part of your body and another, and it doesn't allow liquid to kind of flow through it pretty much unless it secretes it, like say your uh, eccrine sweat glands, for example, or apocrine sweat glands. Cells that are non-epithelial tend to be associated more with forming sort of ground substance and, and they're more structural in a way. They're not, they're not interested in trying to protect you from the outside world. They're trying to actually make uh, something that you know, they're trying to make your body functions, your, your, your organs, et cetera. So in other words, uh, let's say your bone, well, that contains non-epithelial cells that produce osteoid or say the you know, fibroblast and histiocytes that make the collagen in, in the dermis of your skin. So they have a different morphology and they tend to be more spindle in shape mm -hmm. or, or somewhat, uh, they can be kind of angulated and, and, and they're not maybe sort of, uh, uh, stellate if you will so they don't really have that close adherence to one another for the most part if they do kind of form aggregations and sheets they're not really uh hugging each other like epithelial cells are they're just kind of all clustered together almost like uh the clones in star wars if you will so like if you see like a fibrosarcoma for example or dfsb that's why you get those fascicles of cells that that interweave the store form pattern because you have the spindle shaped cells that are forming these little clusters they're not really adherent to one another they're forming clusters and they and they sometimes will kind of interweave with one another mm -hmm. so when you're trying to sort of distinguish between whether it's an epithelial cell or not uh, you kind of look for those features and you're right these do have kind of an angulated and spindle type morphology to them so yeah i agree and notice look at all this material here it's forming all of this ground substance mm -hmm. so these this stuff here is not just there for fun these this stuff here is being formed by these cells so it's actually being manufactured if you will so what are you said fibrohistiocytic um when you say fibro what do you mean there what what cell are you talking about in that situation fibroblast fibroblast and what do fibroblasts manufacture collagen collagen and so that's what we have here. We've got a lot of collagen bundles here that have been formed. And then what about histiocytes? Uh, what do they tend to manufacture? Um, I almost think of them as more like an immune cell. Yeah. Yeah. They don't manufacture a lot. They're, they're just kind of an immune cell that happens to be in the, the tissue. And when they become really prominent, like say, for example, in a dermatofibroma, um, they're not really making any ground substance, so to speak. They just happen to be there and they're involved in in reparation and and the immune the really histiocytes are there to kind of get rid of foreign bodies and mm -hmm. uh, wall off splinters and things like that and, and and deal with infection so yeah you're exactly right so we would but we often tend to lump fibrohistiocytic together and that's one of the non-epithelial uh, lesions that we see what are some other non-epithelial cells that we see commonly in the skin um that we have to think about and the good news is there's not a ton. There, there's not a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So muscle is another. Smooth muscle is one. Mm -hmm. um, nerve. Nerves. Those are the three main ones right there. Mm -hmm. So if you've got those down, you know, you're 90% of the way there. There's a few other rare ones that we throw in there. You know, you can get spindle shaped non-epithelial morphology and vascular lesions. Some people even consider blood vessels to possibly even be related to endothelial cells. Um, you know, or to epithelial because they're endothelial. Um, 
but that's you're right that's that's pretty much it and then you can get some spindle cell morphology in epithelial lesions like for example in uh, squamous cell carcinoma those can become spindle cell in some cases etc so basically that's correct everything you said so far is right on so when you're trying to now come up with a diagnosis mm -hmm. what how would you put this together what do you think the diagnosis is here so overall it's a very you know bland um neoplastic benign lesion of fibroblasts and collagen um which puts us kind of in that fibrohistocytic chapter and i thought that this was most likely uh fibro fibromatosis sorry good, good. yes and fibromatosis exactly that's exactly what this is it's benign neoplasm. Well, I, I agree. It's probably more likely a reactive process. If, if you, it's not truly a neoplasm per se, it's probably like an inflammatory lesion that just the fibroblast and histiocytes are producing all of this collagen. And the histiocytes are probably the inflammatory component of it, like you said. And uh, basically, instead of having more of these cells, when you're dealing with one of these fibromatoses, you have mostly the fibroblast or the, the fibrosis. So you don't have as many fibroblasts. If you got this really early on, you might have a predominance of these cells with less collagen. And then as time goes on, this replaces virtually all of the cells. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the fibromatoses. What are the uh, various entities that are in that chapter? Mm -hmm. So you have this example, which is like either the palmar or plantar uh, fibromatosis, which palmar is associated with Dupin's contracture. Um, yeah, Dupin's contracture, good, yes. Um, you kind of develop that later in life. Um, uh, and then you also have other types of fibromatosis if you're on other surfaces like um, penile fibromatosis, which is um, Pietron's disease. Is that how you say that? <laughs> um, you said the penile version. I thought uh -huh. that was Pyrenees disease. Pyrenees, thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, uh, and then you can have like a deep version, which is also kind of like the desmoid tumor. Good, desmoid tumor, desmoid fibromatosis. What disease is that associated with? What syndrome is that associated with? Gardner's syndrome. Good, Gardner's syndrome. Make sure you know that. They, they probably aren't going to ask a lot of questions about this, but if they do, they very well might ask you that because they would expect you to know that you see that plus the colonic polyps. Mm -hmm. You also get infundibular cysts, autosomal dominant, uh, pretty high incidence of colon cancer. So that's one they they might ask about. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of other settings where we see fibromatoses. Um, you can see it in my like um, web necking. Um, yes, good. <laughs> Uh, the torticollis, the web necking, and what what syndrome is that associated with? Turner's syndrome. Good, Turner's, good. So, they, you know, and the board likes to ask about some of the genodermatoses, so they very well might ask you that. Now, one final question about this. Um, we said fibroblasts and histocytes. Is there any type of subtype of cell that's here as well, other than just pure fibroblast and pure histocytes that's associated with this lesion? Um, I also felt like those are blood vessels. There are a few blood vessels in here, but there's another type of spindle cell that's associated with this that you may not think about, but you should at least be aware of it. That's that's right here. And if we did a special stain, we could maybe demonstrate that these cells were present. Maybe myofibroblast? Good, myofibroblast. Excellent, myofibroblast. And the important thing about those is that they have actin in their cytoplasm and that actin can actually uh, contract and one of the reasons that this thing is dupatrin's contracture not only is it because it replaces the tendon with you know this collagen but these myofibroblasts also may play some role in that as well so just remember that there's also a myofibroblastic uh, lesion that can occur when the myofibroblast actually are, are the most predominant cell okay great Thank you. All right, do this one. Hi, Dr. Cockerell, it's me, Yelena. I'll be describing this case. Okay. So looks like we've got a deep excision here. There's um, a pretty 
nodular structure kind of down below the dermis. There's a little bit of dermis at the top of the slide, but it looks like it's kind of disconnected from. Yeah. The yeah. I think they probably did a similar type of procedure here uh, to what they did in the last one. Obviously here, we're not dealing with volar skin. So they probably said, well, there's something down here. Maybe it's a cyst or something like that. And so they said, well, let's maybe take a punch and then, then see if I can get it out of the little punch hole or Maybe they did an incision and they just submitted that piece of skin also. So yeah, clearly this is where the action is here. Mm -hmm. And from afar, it looks um, pretty well circumscribed. There's some areas of lighter purple as well as some darker purple, um, kind of bluish looking from this far. Good. Excellent. I totally agree. It looks uh, quite well circumscribed, probably once again shelled out, and this one probably shelled out easier than the last one. Um, I agree. It's got this, this bluish gray and purplish-like material in here. So mm -hmm. at low magnification, so again, we, we may go to high magnification to see something totally different, but what do you think this material actually represents here? Mucin. Yeah, mucin. And we say mucin. Um, what's the chemical composition of this mucin? Um, like what makes up the mucin? I yeah, like yeah. What's the actual uh, chemical material itself called? Like glycoproteins? Um, it is, well, I'm not sure it's really a glycoprotein, actually. It's, it's, it's an acid. Okay. Um, I know like you can use like Alicium blue to like stain it. So maybe it's staining for that acid. Yeah. So which acid is it? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. That's all right. Hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic acid. And hyaluronic acid is made, it's connective tissue mucin. So it's mucin that we see in the dermis and it's produced by these same cells just in the last lesion we saw that produced by these fibroblasts and, and his mm -hmm. probably produce some of those, but fibroblasts can also produce abundant mucin. Uh, mast cells also can produce hyaluronic acid. Most likely we know that mast cells have other, you know, products in their cytoplasm, but they may contribute to this as well. But certainly the fibroblasts um, are the things that are producing a lot of this mucin. So they can produce collagen. They can produce this mucin, this hyaluronic acid here that we're looking at. And this is connective tissue mucin. So there's also mucin that is not connective tissue mucin. Like, for example, the mucin that uh, you get in your nose when you have a, a cold or you get you know, bronchitis, that's a sialomucin, which actually comes from mucinous glands, goblet cells. So there are two different kinds of mucin. And uh, that one, I believe, has got the lower pH of it. They used to ask that question on the boards years ago. I don't think they really ask it so much anymore. So we got something here that's got a lot of mucin. Now, mm -hmm. when you see a mixoid lesion like this, um, what's your general approach to the diagnosis? Yes. So the route that I kind of took with this one was looking at kind of like the little vessels that are there, the little squiggly things, um, which to me stood out as very thin sort of like chicken wire vessels. Okay. Um, and then looking at the cells themselves, I was trying to see if there was any pleomorphism, atypia. And then I kind of had a differential for what it could be. So if there was some um, pleomorphism, atypia, we could think of like a mixofibrosarcoma. Okay. But I didn't see a whole lot of atypia. So I was leaning more towards mixoid liposarcoma. And I think in that one, the vessels are more thinner than they would be in the mixofibrosarcoma, which has more kind of curvilinear capillaries. So you think this thing is a malignancy here? Well, that's what I was reading was kind of tricky. It looks like a very benign lesion, but the um, mixoid liposarcomas are actually malignant. 
Yeah, and most of the time when you see those, I'll, I'll point something out in a minute there. But before we go there, do you know what cells these are here I'm pointing to? Are those lipoblasts? No, they're actually mast cells. Okay. And there are a lot of them in here. So any, and that just goes along. Anytime you get a lot of mucin, you see mast cells. So here are mm -hmm. some lipocytes here. Mm -hmm. if you look at them. Um, it's kind of fuzzy right there, but they're really very typical appearing lipocytes. If you see a lipoblast, those cells really have got very atypical nuclei. You'll often see mitotic figures. Um, generally, most of the time when you see something like that, you'll see a large number of them as well. You won't just see a few scattered lipoblasts. You'll see quite a few of them. And I don't really see any lipoblasts here at all. If so, there might may be one or two, but but these are mostly just bland, normal appearing lipocytes with marked amounts of mucin associated with it. And the other mm -hmm. thing is you, you notice that low power, and I think rightly so, is that it's fairly well demarcated. It seems like it's shelled out pretty well. And if this mm -hmm. were a sarcoma, do you think that would be more likely the case or, or no? No. No. Those things are usually very large. You can't get them out with just a simple incision. You know, they're they're usually very large by the time they're diagnosed because people don't recognize them and they just sit there for long periods of time and eventually become very large and with lots of atypicality to them. And you'll biopsy them, you see lots of atypical cells, mitoses, lots of lipoblasts. So um, I really think it's, I agree, I think it's more likely benign. But if it is benign, so we've got a myxoid liposarcoma, what's the benign counterpart of that? A myxoma? Well, that could be just a pure cutaneous myxoma where you have nothing but mucin. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the counterpart of a myxoid liposarcoma? Like a spindle cell lipoma? Well, or just a myxoid lipoma. Uh -huh. so you can get a myxoid lipoma or you can get spindle cell lipomas. Those often will give you a lot of mucin within them. So there's kind of an overlap between spindle cell lipoma and a myxoid lipoma. This one looks more myxoid to me because I don't really see a lot of spindle shaped cells here. It's, it's, you got some of these blood vessels in the background, but you don't really have the spindle shaped cells that you often see with that entity so much here. Mm -hmm. but those are kind of a spectrum of entities. So I think this, this is an example of a myxoid lipoma. This came in uh, from a relatively young person and they thought it was just a benign lipoma and they biopsied it and lo and behold, it had all this myxoid change in it. And we see that not infrequently. They don't really look clinically any different than other types of lipomas. They just are more of a histologic finding. So you think it's a lipoma, you biopsy it, and lo and behold, it's got a lot of mucin in it. Now, you mentioned myxoma itself. Um, once again, the boards like to ask uh, interesting second-order questions. So let's say this was just a cutaneous myxoma, and it didn't have the lipomatous components. Are there any diseases that you need to worry about? Any syndromes you need to worry about in association with cutaneous myxoma? Carney complex. Good. Excellent. That's the one you need to know about. And what do you see in the Carney complex? Um, you can see like myxomas typically in the heart. You, yes, you can get them in the skin too. But yes, atrial myxoma, I think is the, the classic uh, example of what's associated with Carney's complex. What about in the in the skin? What skin findings do we see in association with that? Um, you can kind of get this like um, spotty dispigmentation on the skin. Good. You can see that. And you can also see these kind of unusual uh, melanocytic neoplasms, these so-called pigmented epithelioid melanocytomas or these blue nevus-like lesions. Um, Sometimes these can even have some, they can degenerate into malignancy in some cases. And so that's yet another syndrome that you might be confronted with on the boards that they might ask you about. So just be aware of that also. It's pretty rare, mm -hmm. but you'll see it. And then the other thing that, that you should just keep in mind, we won't go necessarily into it in detail here, but um, all of the different things that can give you massive amounts of mucin in the skin, other than just a cutaneous myxoma, or a myxoid lipoma or liposarcoma, et cetera, you need to think about other things that can be associated with mucin. So I would have a good sort of mindset of differential diagnosis of things that produce abundant mucin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. 
Hi, this is Caroline. I'll take slide three. Okay. All right. So this was a punch um, from low power. Can already tell something's going on in the dermis. Um, see kind of bluish purple swirls. The epidermis looks okay. Is that uh, a totally normal epidermis to you? Oh, not completely. I guess there's a little um, hyperkeratosis. Yeah, it's hyperkeratotic for sure. And uh, there's a, you said you thought the dermis was abnormal here. Yes, I felt like there was, I was looking at the material for a while, but decided it was solar elastosis. Yes, um, good. There is solar elastosis up here. Kind of the blue purple wisps. And then there's superficial perivascular infiltrate with mostly lymphocytes. Yeah, sparse superficial perivascular dermatitis, relatively minimal. Um, the rest of the dermis looks pretty normal to me though. And this probably is trunk or proximal extremity. It's not volar skin because there's a hair follicle here. And so that can tell you if it's got a hair follicle and the cornified layer is thickened, what does that kind of tell you is going on here? Uh, like there's maybe a chronic process going on. Well, they've probably rubbed it a little bit. It's got a little bit of trauma. So in other words, anytime you see kind of a thick cornified layer on volar on skin that's not volar skin, um, it says it's probably been rubbed a little bit or traumatized. So there's probably a, a component of lichen simplex chronicus here to some degree. Okay. And it's, you know, it's obviously not in an intertriginous area. It's got sun damage. So I agree. It's, it's probably somewhere on the extremity, I'm going to guess. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty subtle. We don't really see a whole lot here. So what do yeah. you think about when you when you get a diagnosis that shows you just a very sparse superficial perivascular dermatitis? That's the most common pattern we see histologically. So how are you going to subdivide this now into a more precise diagnosis? So I think I was uh, using like the solar elastosis to guide me and then a few other features like I did see maybe just a few mast cells which could help me think of other things I think initially when I looked at this I was thinking radiation dermatitis but if now I'm thinking something that was more rubbed chronically um and not like a very impressive dermis. Did you happen to look at like this area up no. here at all? Yeah, I was wondering if that was a little bit of staph bacteria, like some. Well, they're product. they're not really clustered, and if you look, this is really hard to see here on this in this stain. But there also were some of these filamentous organisms that were in the cornified layer. This is a fairly subtle biopsy. But if you were to have a, a gram stain, you would see that there are these little tiny filamentous organisms here that are kind of at 90 degree angles in some of these areas here. And uh, okay, you kind so of have to look pretty carefully to see it here. Now, I don't know if you could see it on, on your images or not. But what if I told you that this was gram positive filamentous uh, like rods of grimy bacterium or yeah, grimy bacterium. Yeah. And so I think the main lesson for this slide is just to show when you get a very sparse superficial perivascular dermatitis, your differential diagnosis is almost kind of the nothing, quote, unquote, entities, you know, so clearly it's, you know, you, you're thinking things like drug eruption, um, sometimes atopic dermatitis can give you this pattern, viral exanthems can give you this pattern, subtle amounts of irritant dermatitis can give this pattern. Um, a lot of things could give it. And in this case, it happened to be, you can see that it's been rubbed here. So th this is not normal. Um, if it were normal, you'd have a nice basket weave cornified layer. But right. here, it's probably was due to some kind of a chronic irritant type reaction that caused secondary colonization or maybe overgrowth of some of this carotid bacterium. 
the most so so let's say this is cryobacterium. Um, what are the settings where you see that? What are the three or four main diseases where you see cutaneous cryobacterial infection? I need to review these, but I know you can get erythrasma. Good, erythrasma, um, absolutely, yes. And then the other two, I'm trying to think of. Um, well, what, do you, what if it's like a child that's got this really sweaty, wet, macerated, usually feet, um, and they come and see you and they're, you take off their shoe and it smells like the worst locker room shoe you've ever smelled and you look at their feet and what's that disease called oh like pitted ker keratolysis now, if you look carefully and you see the pits on it yeah it's called pitted keratolysis if they don't have the pits you call it juvenile plantar dermatosis and uh, they're both caused by cryobacterium and cryobacterium likes to live um, in places where the skin is kind of moist and warm and kind of irritated so you know, this is kind of an unusual area. And, you know, like you often will see crying bacterial, not only on volar skin, but sometimes you can even see it, say, in the axilla, the groin area like that. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where this came from. It may have been like, say, an area that was, say, near the axilla or maybe the antecubital fossa or something where this skin had been macerated to some degree and it got a secondary crying bacterial infection because clearly something is causing some damage to the cornified layer here. So that's probably how this happened. Um, there's another, there's one other condition that that you need to include in that differential diagnosis, less commonly recognized, but it's also associated with chronic bacterium, usually in the axilla. Is that like trichomycosis axillary. Yes, good, you got it, exactly. And that's also cryobacterial infection that involves the hair shafts and you get these like beaded granular little areas on the hair shafts. And usually when those people take their shirt off and lift up their arm, you kind of want to leave a room because they really, obviously it's due to poor hygiene. So whenever you don't bathe and wash, it sets up all sorts of secondary bacterial colonization and overgrowth that can result in it it leaves these findings sometimes. So trichomycosis axillaris is the is the last one of those. And of course, acne um, can cause it. Uh, be associated with crying bacteria. All right. So we got a lot of deep seated cutaneous neoplasms this morning. Good morning. I'll do this one, Dr. Cockrell. Okay. Okay. So like you said, first of all, we're pretty deep in the skin. So it looks like. Um, like an enucleation possibly. Um, and seeing these like deep nodule in the skin. So I'm thinking, looking at the cells too, this is neoplastic. Good. You like benign or malignant at this power? Um, I think benign. Yeah. Once again, it kind of shelled out. So we're kind of seeing this morning, things are deep lesions. People take incision biopsies over them and they just kind of pop out. And these often are thought to be cysts clinically. So whenever you get a diagnosis of uh, a clinical of a cyst, you need to always be thinking of a neoplasm other than just purely a cyst. So that's that's true. So once again, uh, what kind of differentiation are we looking at here? So uh, I felt like these were spindle cells. Good. And you have these areas of more hypercellular um, regions and then hypocellular next to it. Okay, great. Any Anything else? We just saw the fibrohistiocytic lesion a minute ago. Yes. We saw the, the lipocytes with all those mast cells and fibroblasts in there. What about the, the shape of these cells compared to those two that we saw before? So these, I would say more like an, if you describe it like an S type of shape, they're not sort of um, yeah. jaggedy. I, they I think like they're more little, like uh, little fish swimming in the water here. They little, they little gradually yes. make, imagine like a little eel or something that's kind of gradually uh, got a little S-shaped sinusoidal morphology. And then, you know, we, we talk about that. When you cut those cells um, in transection, you know, like in cross-section, they, they don't look like, you know, S-shaped cells anymore. They look kind of round like this. 
So here's one that's cut longitudinally and here's one that's cut in cross section. You kind of see that they look a little bit different. So you want to look and see if you can find some of those nice sort of lazy S shape morphology when you're looking at nerve cells. Now there's a couple other things that can kind of help you with potential with neural differentiation versus the others, fibrohistocytic and smooth muscle. If you look at the blood vessels in a neural lesion, they'll often have this kind of pink hyaline morphology uh, of this deposition of PS positive material around the blood vessels in neural lesions. Not all neural lesions, but um, if you see that, that's a helpful clue that you may be looking at neural versus say smooth muscle or fibrohistocytic. So yeah, this is neural. So now that you're in the neural category, what are some of the entities that you have to think about? Um, so schwannoma, um, okay. and then what, like what's the other name for schwannoma? It's a neurolimoma. Yeah, neurolimoma, and that refers to neural limb means the nerve sheath, if you will. So they're kind of talking about cells that make up not the actual axons, but more the Schwann cells. So that's why it's called schwannoma and also neurolimoma, which is a synonym. And then uh, what are a couple other neural lesions that you should know about for the boards? Uh, neurofibroma. Obviously neurofibroma, and there's several different subtypes of those, but we won't necessarily get into those. What, uh, what else? There's not neuroma? Too terribly many, but I'm sorry. A neuroma? Neuroma, absolutely. And there's several different forms of those. So neurolimomas and schwannomas, those are neural neoplasms of the uh, outer lining, the, the sustentacular cells of the nerve. So these are the Schwann cells that make the myelin. And then neuromas are actually of the axons that make it. So yeah, you can get like a Morton's neuroma. That's where the nerves, the axons actually proliferate. Um, you get a traumatic neuroma. Uh, so there's several of those. There's palisaded encapsulated neuroma. That's a, yet another neuroma that we talk about. And there's the multiple mucosal neuromas, uh, would recommend knowing those syndromes because they might ask you about those. And then uh, there might be one or two others. What are just one or two other neural neoplasms that you should know about just in general? Uh, maybe granular cell tumor. Good, good. Um, could we put like Merkel cell in here too? You theoretically could throw that in. Yeah, that's kind of the uh, neural crest cell derivatives. But then the, the neurothechioma, a lot of people okay. think about that. Uh, and then there's the kind of the nerve sheath mixoma, they call it, which is that's one form of neurothechioma. And then there's the cellular neurothechioma that, uh, again, those cells are also part of the they're not Schwannian, but they're probably in the some of the cells that, that are associated more with the lining of the nerve, the outer part of the nerve, that, as opposed to the actual axons themselves. So those are the main neural neoplasms that you need to know. There, there's not a, a zillion of them that they're going to expect you to really be proficient with. So what which of those diagnoses do we have here? So I think this is a schwannoma. You're right. Now, there's two main types. And I think I'm showing you an area right here, which allows you to distinguish between those two main types. Yes. So this is, we're looking at the Antony A area. Good. The Antony A. So there's an Antony A schwannoma, and then there's an Antony B schwannoma. Now, why is the, this considered the Antony um, A variety? So it's hypercellular and then has the, what we call the barricade bodies. Good. This is a varicae body, and I uh, kind of think of it almost like uh, the Trojans over here and the Greeks over here, and they're getting ready to charge at one another. There's this little clear area, acellular area, and these cells kind of, they're, they're lining up across from one another. That's, that's a varicae body like this. So you see varicae, it's nice that it rhymes with Antony A, so it's easy to remember. And then in the Antony B type, you don't really see varicae bodies. You'll see more of a uh, spindle cell morphology with a lot more mucin there. And when you think about the formation of a uh, schwannoma versus the formation of a neurofibroma, the schwannoma arises kind of off the outer part of the nerve twig. So you'll often see the 
residual nerve twig may be down here. This may be it right here. I'm not sure that's it, but you'll often see what looks like a normal nerve, and then you'll see this thing kind of coming off of it. And in a neurofibroma, you never really see that because it actually, the process occurs from within the nerve and it sort of explodes out. So you can kind of think of it if you were a, a little sort of man with a bomb and you set the bomb off on the outer part of the nerve twig, well, then it blows up and it makes the the schwannoma, if you set the bomb off in the middle of the nerve twig, well, then it makes a neurofibroma. So that's just a simplistic way of, of thinking about it. So good. This is an a, uh, Antony A neurolinoma or schwannoma. Here's some of that pink material around some of these blood vessels here as well. And these are benign. They can rarely become malignant, but uh, this was a completely benign variant of it. Thank you. You're welcome. So now we'll shift gears. We've got some inflammatory dermatopathology here to show you. So this is one that you can, you know, you're going to get this on the exam. Hey, Dr. Crockle, it's Jessica. I can take this one. Okay. All right. So we have a, a punch and it looks like we're on the scalp. We have a Good. hair. On this absolutely stuff. are on the scalp. Yes. And then... In the epidermis, we see this extensive acantholysis. It's supravasilar. And particularly on the left side, you can see like the tombstone row of cells. Yeah, so this is a fairly easy one to diagnose, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the diagnosis here? Pemphigus. Okay, but which subtype of pemphigus? Uh, pemphigus vulgaris. Okay. Now, are there any other clues other than what you mentioned that help you here? Yeah, so I think to differentiate between all the different types of pemphigus, I'm looking at whether the split is in the superficial dermis or a little bit deeper in the dermis, and this one was deeper. So then I was leaning towards like vulgaris. Or, Is there anything else that helps you, like that I'm showing you right here? Yes, and then the hair follicles. Or yeah, tracking down the follicles. So if we put, let's say you're looking down and you say, ah, this is pemphigus vulgaris, no problem. And then you see some choices down there. Um, one of them is the pemphigus vulgaris variant of Grover's disease. Would you feel confident in not choosing that? Mm. Well, if it was with Grover's, I think I would expect for the acantholysis to not be as extensive. Good. Number one should be focal, right? So it's not as diffuse and extensive such as this. And another clue that you're not dealing with Grover's is right here. Never goes down into the follicle, certainly not this far. If it goes in the follicle, it's just barely going to get the infundibulum. It's not going to go down into this area. And generally, Grover's doesn't involve hair follicles. So if you saw that, you would say this could not be Grover's, pemphigus vulgaris variant. Now, there's multiple different variants of Grover's. There's superficial pemphigus, deep pemphigus, Haley-Haley variant. There's a spongiotic variant. There's even a epidermolytic hyperkeratosis variant now that's been described. So, you know, there's several different variants, but you wouldn't choose that because this is far too extensive for that. Notice at the edge. So if you if you look at this area right here, if you just saw this zone alone, would you be quite as confident in calling it pemphigus vulgaris if I just showed you this field right here? Mm. Well, there's... A couple of things that would make me lean towards pemphigus if I just saw this area. So one, I can see that it's pretty extensive. And then two, there were a couple of EOs that I could see. Could this be Haley Haley if I just showed you this field alone right here? I think it could. Yeah. Maybe, because yeah. it's not just super basal, right? Here right. it is, but here it's not. You know, here it's also at the top of the epithelium. So it's not just a tombstone morphology like the textbooks say. You know, textbooks can be misleading. <laughs> so beware of them. And also notice this, you've got some dyskeratosis up here. 
-hmm. You don't usually see that in Pemphigus either, do you? Pemphigus vulgaris. So if I just showed you this field alone, you might say, gosh, that almost looks like Darius up here. That almost looks a little bit like Haley Haley. Maybe it is Grover's disease because mm -hmm. you got multiple different features within the same specimen. So that's a little bit unusual. But here's an important clue. If you look off to the side, you get the classic tombstone morphology, which you never see in Haley Haley. So this you don't see in Haley Haley. You can see Haley Haley-like morphology sometimes in Pemphigus vulgaris, but you don't see this in Haley Haley disease. Now, why do you think we're seeing this beautiful tombstone single layer of cells right at the edge here of the biopsy? You think that's just an accident? Probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you know, what happens is you'll do a punch biopsy and then guess what you're doing? You're inducing a Nikolsky sign when you're doing your punch. And so it gives you this beautiful suprabasilar acantholysis just right here that looks classic for pemphigus vulgaris to the edge. But then you look in the center of it, and maybe it's reepithelialized. You know, maybe it's got some, you know, acantholysis at the top. So if you really want to get the, the most classic features, you know, look inside the follicle, look at the edge. That's really the best. Often you'll often get the really most classic features of pemphigus kind of at the edge of the biopsy. Interestingly enough, if you just had this, like a punch right out of that, I wouldn't call that Pemphigus vulgaris with certainty. If I were signing that out, I would I would describe it and say, I, you know, I need some more clinical information. You know, this could theoretically be a, a dairyase. It's got FAD right up here. So it's got dyskeratosis. So it's just a, it just shows you that a lot of these immunobullous diseases, these acantholytic processes, they don't always read the textbooks. These, this guy did, <laughs> but this guy didn't read the textbook over here. So they can look a little bit different and they can be kind of confusing. And the immunofluorescence of Pemphigus vulgaris, you know what that should show, right? Mm -hmm. The chicken wire pattern. Yeah, of what? Which immunoreactives? Um, so you have, as, like what, the targeting? Well, yeah, okay. So you know what the target an antigen is, right? So you see deposits of IgG and C3. That's like Good. one. And it's attacking which protein? Desmoglein, mainly three. Yeah, so good. You know that. That's good. They're going to ask you that. So good. You know it. Great. You need to know that. And that's like knowing your telephone number. So that's going to be on there. They're going to ask you that. Now, they could ask you some other questions about this. You know, they might ask you, you know, perineoplastic pemphigus and some other things like that. So make sure you know everything there is to know about immunobullous diseases because, boy, they love to ask that. So you, you'll definitely get some questions about this. And make sure you can distinguish between pemphigus vulgaris and superficial pemphigus. This wouldn't be superficial pemphigus. That, that is not this deep. It's going to be up in this area here, just in the you know granular and spinous layers. So that actually looks more like bullets of a tigo. And again, that, that can involve follicles, but not generally to the degree here. So this is a, a good example of pemphigus vulgaris. Now, the only other thing they might throw in there would be maybe pemphigus vegetans. And, you know, this maybe is kind of early Pemphigus vegetans forming. You know, that's why it's maybe got that Verrucus feature a little bit. It's not, it's not there yet. But if you see really marked, thickened Verrucus epithelium associated with superbasal or acantholysis focally, that's Pemphigus vegetans. Our last one. This is another one that you can just, you're going to get on the exam without any questions. So... Nice to know that you've got things on here that you're going to be confronting. Hey, this is Taylor. I'll take this one. Okay, great. So we have a punch biopsy. Um, I think we're in the vesicular dermatitis category. It looks like we have an intraepidermal vesicle. Okay. Um, as for the mechanism of the blister, it doesn't look like there's spongiosis. Um, I don't think it's acantholysis um, based on how the epidermis looks underneath the split. Um, and then kind of looking around in certain areas, um, it looks like there's a little bit of like some vacuolar interface in some areas. Yeah, good. So good. I was thinking this was probably due to some like ballooning degeneration. 
could be partially that. I, I agree that's a possibility here. And then there are some areas of some necrotic keratinocytes, um, a little bit okay. there, I think, especially like above the blister. You mean like in this area here? Yeah. Okay, on a scale of one to 10, what would you say the degree of epidermal necrosis is here? Hmm. Um, maybe like a six. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, the whole thing's necrotic. Okay. So, so 10. <laughs> but what about this up here? What's going on above that here? This is a this is a sophisticated diagnosis, by the way, here. I don't know they would show you this on the exam. But you're going to know way more than your colleagues here. In fact, I've seen seasoned dermatopathologists miss this diagnosis. So, what's going on here that I'm, the arrow is touching? What what do we? What's this structure that I'm pointing at here? So you're going to have to turn your brain off to all this other stuff and just just say, what do you see right here? I mean, the stratum corneum. It looks yes. like a little bit of basket weaving. It's classically basket weave cornified layer. Good. Now you've got an epidermis that's necrotic underneath that. What does that tell you about how rapidly this process developed here? I would say very acutely. Good. It didn't even have time to make any parakeratotic nuclei like psoriasis, for example, or like numular dermatitis or atopic dermatitis. It didn't even have time. It killed the epidermis quickly, caused a blister sloughed off. And then what's going on down here? That's where we see like the vacuolar interface. There's some- But if the epidermis the died mm -hmm. and it's sloughed off, so just imagine you look, look down at your own skin and say, okay, this skin right here is dying. And then it sloughs off and make a blister. And then come a couple of days later, you take a biopsy of it. What does it look like? What's happening? Is it like trying to re-epithelialize? Yes, yes, good. It's fully re-epithelialized. So this is the, the necrotic epidermis, basket we by layer, re-epithelialized, a little bit of residual vacuolar alteration. So this, this process probably isn't totally gone yet. In other words, this, this is, we're probably looking at maybe the late stage of this disease. We're not in the early stage or we wouldn't even have this right? It had, mm -hmm. If we got it really it's like on day three, all we would see would be this plus a denuded epithelium with a superficial perivascular infrared of lymphocytes hugging this area. Now we just have a little bit of residual lymphocytic infiltrate, a little vacuolar alteration here and there, maybe an occasional dyskeratotic keratinocyte. So this thing is kind of now in a resolving stage. This is when it was acute, re-epithelialized, so thinking in terms of the chronology of diseases, this is in the later stage of this disease, okay? So what disease do you know that would do this? It so, kills the epidermis quickly. Yeah, I was thinking we were on like the EMSJSTEN spectrum. Excellent. That's exactly the spectrum that you're on. Exactly the spectrum that you're on. And so... If you just had this, it'd be more difficult to diagnose. This really helps you if you know this, these findings that I just mentioned. You. Now, I've seen a lot of guys make that mistake where they say this is an intraepidermal blister. This is not an intraepidermal blister. This is a subepidermal blister that's re-epithelialized beneath it, fully epithelialized beneath it. So this, this is a subepidermal process. Kill the epidermis. And that's why it formed the blister. So that's that's really what happened here. Um, now let's say you're, you know, you're looking at your multiple choice suggestions, and yeah, erythema multiforme is in there, and you're smart because you know that this was, is basically an S scar. It's basically a dead epidermis with normal basket cortified layer in there, and some other choices are in there, like porphyria cutanea tarda. Is that a good choice? Do we like that? 
I don't think you would see necrosis in that process. You can get necrosis, but you get sort of individual keratinocytes that, that are sort of interspersed with this so-called caterpillar sign. And then you also get the thick uh, PS pods material around the blood vessels and the dermis beneath, and you get festooning and, and whatnot. So you usually, however, do not get confluent epidermal necrosis like this with a normal basket with cornified layer overlying. So that wouldn't be a very good choice. What about bullous pemphigoid? Um, in bullous pemphigoid, I would expect eosinophils. Um, yeah, and you usually don't get necrotic epidermis overlying it. Usually it's a normal dermis, uh, normal epidermis that's just got all those eos and the inflammation beneath it, and it just forms that blister. So if you look at the roof of a, bull, a blister of bullous pemphigoid, it's not necrotic like this. Different mechanism of action, right? You've got a uh, immunobullous process with immune deposits at the dermatomal junction that causes the separation. It's not killing the epidermis. It's basically dissolving the adhesion of the epidermis to the underlying dermis. Here you've got necrosis. You've got targeted cell death that kills the epidermis, making a blister. So it's a different pathophysiologic mechanism of action. So it's not going to look the same either, right? Mm -hmm. um, what if they put something like uh, hand, foot, and mouth disease down there? Does that give you this kind of epidermal necrosis? I think it could to some extent, but not this like full thickness. Good. <laughs> not usually a complete full thickness change like this, not with a basket weave cornified layer. There's usually some... Uh, parakeratosis and whatnot, and you get like ballooning degeneration with the vacuolar alteration and well, the, the collection of fluid within the cytoplasm, but not usually this kind of extensive necrosis. So good. Those are all things that you, you really wouldn't see. So just make sure that you are aware of this. Now, if you were going to choose between say TEN and EM Stevens-Johnson, are there any of those that you would, you'd favor one versus the other? As you know, this is sort of a subjective sort yeah. of question in a way i think it it can be hard to tell on path and the clinical would help a lot but with this full thickness maybe this is more sjs or ten but i think you could see that in em as well yeah you could see it in all of all of the above some people say tn um, has less inflammation and uh you know if this were TN, it, it, it might not even have had a chance to re-epithelialize yet because you're going to usually see that patient quickly and, and biopsy them. But I don't really make a lot of distinction between those. Now, what do you think about RIME, the new kind of mycoplasma-related erythema deformity? Do you think that you can tell any difference between that and just classic EM, say, induced by a herpes or by a drug eruption? I am not sure what the path would show for that. It looks like this. And, and, and I'm not a big splitter. Um, a lot of people like to split that out and say it's a different disease. When I was in residency, we were taught that uh, mycoplasma was a pretty common cause of erythemal deformity. Mm -hmm. But now they're calling it sort of a special version of erythemal deformity, if you will. So I, I guess maybe there's some rationale to that. But basically, histologically, and being kind of a simple old pathologist to me, um, it looks the same. And so it's largely the same diagnosis histopathologically. So I'm not sure if it's got some kind of different immune mechanism that's leading to that, that the people are talking about these days, but at the end of the day, it produces a histologic change that looked like this. So I don't know what caused this. Um, if an uh, internist calls me up and says, well, you diagnose this erythema deformity, what's the cause? I'm going to say, you've got to go back and work the patient up because it can be a lot of things. Because histologically, it's basically just one reaction pattern associated with a lot of different causes. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much. And uh, Brian put together a little funny sort of thing there. Uh, so thank you guys for attending. And uh, we will see you next time. If you want to go back and look at these again, you can go to our website here and review it on your own also. Take care. Uh -huh.